Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Welcome back, everyone, to another week at the Damage Report. I'm John Adarola. Brooke Thomas is here because, of course, it is Monday. Yeah. It's good to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm glad to have you here, especially because uh, it, it went through my mind as we were hearing the intro song. I feel like I haven't done this in months. Oh, it feels like I that? took a few <laughs> days off for Thanksgiving, and oh God, you miss it. I feel more unqualified to do this than I normally do. <laughs> so, this is going to be an awesome show. Uh, it should actually be good. We have great topics to talk about. We're going to be talking, obviously, about the, the issues at the border uh, over the weekend. Uh, we've got some breaking news uh, on the economy that's just delightful. We've got that for you. Later on the show, we're going to be joined by J.C. Reese, the author of The End of Animal Farming, to talk about industrialized agriculture and its effect both on your health, uh, on the economy, and on climate change as well. That is going to be awesome. Speaking of climate change, we're going to be closing out the show by talking about the uh, the big government climate change report that they snuck out in the wee hours of Black Friday. Uh, so we're going to have that for you too. So lots to talk about. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've had a lot of caffeine too. Yeah. So just a lot of disclaimers. A lot going on. You lasted uh, two hours. Was that a record in your um, news break during oh, the holiday? Two hours. Yeah, what I really that? didn't want to. I get notifications when <laughs> Donald Trump tweets, which is probably the worst health decision I've ever made mm-hmm. is to sign up for those. Okay. And I have literally I like made pizza accurate. with peeps on it, but I think this is worse. <laughs> um, I have done. So that. gross. Yes. What? <laughs> It was pretty good, actually. I like peeps, but on pizza, was there? It was a trend. Was it like a brief trend? Sweet stuff on the bottom of it? No, no, no. You put it on top. So the trend was peeps on pizza. The later trend was diarrhea. Okay, got it. um, Anyway, uh, we're gonna jump into the news. I just want to (laughs) briefly mention before we get to our big stories. uh, I mean, not that this is not big, but uh, GM announced that they're gonna be closing five plants. Uh, A combined fifteen thousand jobs are expected to just poof, they're gone. And that's the immediate jobs that they're getting rid of, 15,000. But we know that in these communities, in Michigan and those sorts of areas, Mm -hmm. those 15,000 jobs make so many other jobs, suppliers for them and things like that, the dealerships that were selling the cars. I mean, 15,000 could be 30,000 or 50,000. We honestly don't know and we might never know. But those jobs are going away for a lot of different reasons. Some of it is going to be GM's fault, possibly some offshoring of the jobs, moving to other places, things like that. In addition, they say that Trump's tariffs on imported steel have cost them $1 billion. And we've talked about that before. That was a story months ago. The idea that a car company could have an additional $1 billion in costs and it not have any ripple effects on jobs seems a little bit ridiculous. So um, those workers, you know, terrible situation for them and their families. Far more than 15,000 people will, of course, be affected by this. And uh, that's what we get. With Donald Trump and his ridiculous economic policies. You know, it's not entirely on that, but that is the portion that he has contributed. No, it's important because his supporters swear that this exactly, this was not gonna happen. In Mm -hmm. fact, the opposite was going to happen. And he keeps pretending as if things like this aren't happening. Yeah, Donald Trump spoke in that area and said to the workers, don't sell your homes, don't leave the area, the jobs are all coming back. Mm -hmm. And now the jobs are gonna be gone. Their housing prices are gonna tank because that's the big industry in that area. He has screwed over tens of thousands of Americans. And many people in that exact same sort of situation will vote for him to be reelected. Right, anyway. So there's a sort of economic suicide there, unfortunately, but just terrible. It's terrible to see this. It's part of a trend, obviously, that's been going on for some time. Right. Again, some of this is definitely on the hands of GM. Uh, companies choosing to send these jobs overseas. We're seeing less of that in some of these industries, but still a ton. And you know, my heart goes out to all the people who are benefited by this. Mm. That said, let's move to uh, the border. Over the weekend, there was a uh, peaceful march uh, at the border, uh, the southwestern US border, um, protesting against uh, US asylum policies, the lack of expedited asylum requests and things like that. Um, that march got out of hand. And some of the marchers, there were something like 500. Some of them attempted to go around Mexican police who had set up temporary barricades and shield wall lines. Some people got close to one of the areas of fencing. Apparently, some people tried to get through it. There's, to my mind, no knowledge of anyone who actually did. 
But some people got close to it. And so uh, the Border Patrol, which has been granted uh, is about a week ago, I was actually gonna do this story when I got back. It was a report coming out mm -hmm. that the rules of engagement for Border Patrol had been loosened. And uh, even up to and including lethal force could be used against migrants. Um, but even before we got back from the holiday, they're now using those loosened rules of engagement. And right. so they tear gassed crowds of migrants. Um, Best case scenario, you have full grown adults who are fleeing violence in their countries. Worst case scenario, you have the elderly and children, including babies, who are being tear gassed by our government. Which so we're seeing photos America. of, exactly. Exactly, exactly we're gonna what's be, happening. Yeah, we're gonna be showing some of those. Um, that's horrendous news. Yeah. You know, I mean, the news has been pretty rough for a couple of years. Um, this don't is like to see the tear gas in the kids, though. Unexpected and not unexpected in a way that um, I haven't been following the news. Just almost when we first started hearing little pieces, he's putting little words out saying essentially that this is going to start happening. Like he's gonna defend the border at all costs, no matter what, yeah. threatening to shut it down. It's just something that last year, two years ago, I wouldn't have expected to mm -hmm. see. Yeah. yeah so now, surprising in that way, that just because like of basic humanity, I don't know. Yeah, I tried, so whenever something like this happens, uh, I try to go and see has anything like this happened before to put context. And apparently back in 2013, there was an incident, I think in Texas at the border where pepper spray was used. I don't know, it wasn't clear how big the group was and there was no indication that there were children or kids or, or you know babies, anything like that. Um, but this was tear gas being launched into another country against migrants, um, that seems noteworthy. And I know we're gonna talk about there's a lot of people in America that are apologizing for this or make, you know, doing their apologetics for this sort of policy. Um, but I, I think that you just have to accept that this is now what we get in our country. Um, Donald Trump ecstatic about this sort of thing. Fox News is loving it and we're gonna give you more details in a bit. It's also just such blatant racism. Like that's mm -hmm. it, you know, because the conversation starts with, well, they're sending, you know, rapists and murderers. Okay, cool. These are not that. Here's mm -hmm. proof of that. Okay, well now we're gonna change our asylum rules. Wait, why? Yeah. Why? Well, and he can't. <laughs> so a judge actually blocked those that changed the asylum rules that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, yeah. thankfully, because he doesn't have the power of a king. We're gonna have a video in a second about how he responds to these sorts of challenges to his power. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. why. Exactly. Look, I, I didn't. I didn't take any of his tweets uh, after this because they're just BS. They're 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 spreading lies. Right. But this morning he did tweet that uh, these people who are gassed are hardened criminals. Most of them are hardened criminals. He doesn't know who any of these people are. One individual. He has no idea whatsoever. Right. Just says they're hardened criminals, and a third of the country accepts. Yep. Sign me up, gas the criminals. Right. Okay, so Donald Trump hates when he is checked by lawyers or by the Supreme Court or any of the other courts. And here's a description of that. When you talk to people around him at the moment, he is very, very inflamed about this issue, like sincerely inflamed. Yes, part of it's politics, but he is raging hot angry at Kirsten Nielsen, the Homeland Security Secretary. You gotta remember, in Trump's mind, it, you know, he doesn't want to hear legal. One, one aide once said to me with Trump, you want to get him to do something, just tell him the lawyers won't allow it. That's the <laughs> quickest way, and Trump's like, all right, we're doing Forget it. Forget it, we're going to do so it. So when, anyway. when you hear legalistic, he just, he goes into a rage and he doesn't want to hear it. He wants to hear, no, it's our land, it's our border, blunt force, stop them. And whenever she comes back with, well, actually, Mr. President, there are these laws, and the, he shuts down. So he's incredibly frustrated. He hasn't had any success building the wall so far. It's all just been repairs and, and very paltry amounts of money. And if they don't give him the money he wants, I don't rule it out. Okay, so that's Jonathan Swan of Axios, a good reporting there. Um, it, it's weird that they went through all of that though, mm -hmm. and nobody is like, yeah, this is the approach of a dictator. Mm -hmm. This is an authoritarian ruler who believes that the laws don't matter, that the courts can't check him, that he doesn't have to consult with Congress or the legislature or anything like that. He can do whatever he wants. And anytime he's stymied in that, he gets enraged right. like King Joffrey. This is just, this is authoritarianism. That's all it is. And for some reason, we're still not saying that. It's so repetitive though. It's this, it's, it's, this is just the latest example. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, and, and the thing is, like, thankfully, we do have some checks. Uh, so when he tries to set up a Muslim ban, thankfully, uh, at least for a while, the court struck down most of it. When he tries to unilaterally change the asylum laws, which he does not have the ability to do, that was actually overruled. But he also now has a very friendly and increasingly friendly majority in the Supreme Court. So when it finally gets there, will they uphold his changes to the asylum rules? He might. 
you know, Kavanaugh, we know his approach to these sorts of issues, how partisan he is. Uh, there's every reason to believe that. The we need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. These, uh, the, the district courts and the appeals courts that overrule his decisions are simply road bumps mm -hmm. on the path to his authoritarian designs on immigration policy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back though, I wanna focus on the, the tear gassing specifically and how it's being presented to Americans after this. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Okay, so uh, I wanna go back to our first topic just briefly. Mm -hmm. Uh, tear gas has now been used on a set of migrants uh, who are close to the border in Southwest US, including children, including babies that were being carried. Um, based on the Twitter response that I have seen from, I guess I'll say Trump fans, maybe conservative generally, maybe Americans generally, the reaction has been meh, which is disturbing. And I think one of the reasons that we get that sort of reaction is because uh, the news uh, covers tear gassing in a really weird way. Uh, we found one example of it. Take a look at this. To clarify, the the type of deterrent being used is OC pepper spray. It's literally water, pepper with a small amount of uh, alcohol for evaporation purposes. It's natural. You could actually put it on your nachos and eat it. Uh, so it's a good way of deterring people without uh, long-term harm. So uh, I just want to briefly say the the like sort of. Just <laughs> understated racism, just in that Ron Colburn. You could put it on food. What's a food? Nachos. I'm just gonna choose nachos, right. okay? I'm sure Fox News fans will love that reference when you're gassing migrants from Central America. Like that's um, where we're going now. Like the like pepper spray is natural, so it's, it's okay. Natural. Yeah. I don't know. The melon bullets is natural. Does that mean you you just you're fine with it being in your body? And I want to see him eat it. Okay. That's the thing. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what like, I want. Let's so, let's look, try that. Here's the thing. I've never been tear gassed. I actually don't know how bad it is. But apparently, Fox News has found an expert. Ron Colburn apparently knows exactly how bad it is. So I want to. I don't want to see him get tear gassed. I want to tear gas Ron Colburn. I want to spray in his eyes some of that stuff. That's really not that bad. Right. It's like something you put on your food. It's like some paprika or some cinnamon being dusted into your eyeballs. That's that's, that's how bad it is. That's the bar. It is technically somewhat edible. So exactly. this is and like we're at like it's like Sheriff Joe Arpaio level. Exactly. Of and the thing is like ridiculous. This is right now. there are millions of Americans who will see a headline, kids get gassed, and then they reach a branching point. Mm -hmm. Does this fit in with my values or is this an abomination that I as a thinking moral human have to do something about? Let me turn on the news. Okay, it's not that bad. Ugh. It could go on your food. Fox News, their job now is to tell people all of your, your deep-seated moral objections that you feel, that sort of gut reaction that what's going on in this country is fundamentally wrong on multiple different levels, don't listen to any of that. Everything's cool, go back to sleep. It's okay if we're putting babies in cages, it's okay if we're gassing kids. It doesn't matter, it's totally cool. They're kind of brown and they eat nachos, so how bad could it really be? But that is what is being presented to millions of Americans every day. Let alone the fact that, like, you just like look at that picture right there. This is the most 
traumatic experience. Like for the rest of these lives, those little kids, they look like four and five, three mm-hmm. and four. They didn't even, they were wearing diapers. You yeah. know what I mean? And um, this is just the most traumatic experience that this is something yeah. that most children would never see, you and know, here never in America. Experience. And then, of course, you know, there's also then another hump that they've got to get over in hopes that they are able to stay mm-hmm. with their parents if they are able to get over here and apply for asylum and seek asylum. But um, I, I just, I don't know, I just like think about those kids. Nobody wants to leave their homes. And that's almost the forgotten aspect of this. Yeah. Nobody, pe- people like their home. They love their home country. They love where they're from. They have to leave mm-hmm. for their safety and to for- possibly not being killed. Right, and for the safety of their children. Yeah. Everybody wants to stay where they grew up, where their family is, where, where, where it's, you know, everything they know, mm-hmm. where, and nobody wants to come here to a strange place with all this racism. Yeah, it's just they have to. And we, it, I, I don't know. And, and what you were saying about um, people, you know, you have to reach a point. You, this is something that you have to have a strong opinion on. Mm. It's it, you just there's no in the middle. And once we saw what was happening with all the children being stripped away from their parents, we, we saw just far too many people who did not care. Who were okay with it? And who were okay with it because. They feel like these people are not human Mm -hmm. and that they really just like honest to God feel that we here just deserve so much more in the terms of just like basic human rights simply because we were lucky enough to be born here. And I just find that absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, at the very least they consider these people to be less human. Right. And uh, so they're okay with us brutalizing them. And that's why, I mean, I mean, I tweeted, I, I don't think it's too controversial, but I think a significant portion, possibly a majority, possibly a super majority of Trump fans would be okay if it had not been tear gas. If Absolutely. they had been gunning these people down. Yeah. I mean, like you can look at the tweets. It's horrifying. They're saying it. They should have used bullets. Mm-hmm. And sure, there's a bit of anonymity that makes people for whatever reason sociopaths. I don't understand, you know, why that happens to humans, but it does happen to humans. But you look and they are ecstatic about this. They want to see these people brutalized. They don't. They do not consider these people to be humans the same way that we are. So, if it goes beyond tear gas, if it goes to them using live ammunition, you will have a significant portion of the people that you sit on a bus with every day, that come into your businesses every day. Maybe they're in your family as well. They're okay with the mass murder of these sorts of people. But you know, Fox News is going to present that you know uh, tear gas is something that you put on nachos, nachos or whatever. Uh, Brett Ehrlich found uh, a great video of uh, not kids being gassed because that's actually horrible, but um, members of the military that have to undergo this training, how do they react to being pepper sprayed? Take a look. What happens is they feel an inflammation, it feels like a burning of the skin. They start getting mucus building up in their nose, their mouth, they start to gag. So it mostly affects the respiratory system and also their sight because their, their eyes are gonna wanna slam shut. <laughs> Like there's 20 million needles in my eyes and like fire. My eyes are burning. I can barely breathe. Oh my God, man. Be all right. <sighs> Calm down. It feels like they're rubbing sandpaper in your eyes. Okay. Okay. Non-stop. Okay, so just to be clear, that is the exact same OC pepper spray that you can put on your nachos or on migrants coming to the southern border. And let's just bear in mind, those are, we all agree, the toughest people in our entire country. Talking about thousands of needles in their eyes, sandpaper being rubbed on their eyes, we're using it on children. And I also imagine that there's gonna be a little relief after this. Like they're, you know, letting them experience it for a couple moments and then. They're going, they're pouring milk over their faces. Like they're taking mm-hmm. care of them. They're not gonna let them burn out for an hour. Yeah. Think about it. These people, the, the people just in the picture that we saw didn't have shoes. Those babies didn't have pants on. They yeah. literally are just gonna have to experience that. Yeah. And that's it. They're just out there in the sun, away from home, and they're just gonna have to like let that ride out. That's what we're doing yeah. to people who just want to live just like basic good lives. They just exactly. wanna live. That's it. They're not. They're, there's not some like hidden pot of gold over here that people are seeking. They yeah. just want to live. Yeah. Look, if if there's one weird silver lining that this situation serves as a reminder that uh, it was great that some of the electoral results turned out pretty good. Right. Uh, the work's not done. This is going to be that sort of like the that, if the Democratic uh, majority was already in the House, <sighs> that same thing would have happened. Um, there will be some oversight, which will be which will be great. But that exact same sort of thing probably would have happened because Donald Trump exercises unilateral authority over a number of different areas of U.S. policy, especially perhaps more than anything else. 
the our immigration policy. So look, it's great that things are moving in a better direction, but we're not there yet. And so buckle up, you've got two, maybe four or eight, God knows how many long years to get back to some sense of normalcy in our country. That said, we're gonna end this block just a little bit early because I wanna have time to talk about both Nancy Pelosi's op-ed that came out recently. She is trying to set an agenda for the new Democratic majority, assuming that she ends up as the actual speaker. And then how are the anti-Medicare for all lobbyists going to attack that policy? We've got some leaked documents we'll be analyzing after this. Welcome back, everyone. In this block, we're not gonna be talking about our favorite desserts, although we were in the break. We were, uh, yeah. Maybe someday we'll get to that. Unfortunately, we've got some big <laughs> issues we gotta deal with first. Um, eventually, wake up call. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what are the Democrats actually going to do with their House majority? We've debated what they should do uh, on the show previously. It is likely at this point that Nancy Pelosi will be the speaker. I mean, there's still there's time for development, but that's the way things look like they're going, regardless of what we might want and we might disagree. Uh, but she has posted an op-ed in the Washington Post detailing what she wants the agenda for the new House majority to be. So let's break down a couple of these different areas. These are excerpts uh, directly from the op-ed. Uh, you can go read that if you wanna see the entire thing. Uh, interestingly, the first order of business she says is ending the dominance of money in politics. For far too long, big money and corporate special interests have undermined the will of the people and subverted policymaking in Washington, enabling soaring healthcare costs and prescription drug prices, undermining blah, 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 um, and all these bad things. So money in politics leads to bad outcomes. I think that that is a great thing to have first in the agenda. But I think it's a little bit weird because she also constantly says that the reason she should be speaker is because she's the best fundraiser in America. It's like the Which, main okay, argument you are. for her. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, that seems weird, don't mm -hmm. you think? Like, okay, I mean, it would be more admirable if the best fundraiser in the country was willing to lay down her arms by banning money in politics. But I, I don't know, I don't really see that. I mean, look, I get what she would probably say. She would say, I don't wanna get money from you know all these different things. I wanna get it from, you know, I guess, unions or regular people. Um, there are people out there who are doing that, like Beto was doing that, Bernie certainly has done, lots of politicians have been doing that recently. Kamala Harris and Kristen Gillibrand have banned corporate PAC money. Um, has Nancy Pelosi? I don't think so. This also just reminds me, it's just like when you were thinking, like, what is next? Well, lucky for you, Nancy Pelosi wrote an article. It just, it, all, it reminds <laughs> me for you. It reminds me of Jeff Flake's tweets. It's like, I think that we've gotten to the space where, mm -hmm. and, not, and not at all like I believe that she just does, isn't behind any of this and is not gonna do anything, but this is just not what people want and need. They don't need a list of just mm -hmm. your thoughts. Oh, I'm fine with the list. Right, I think they need like you to break it down. Just pick one of these and just break it down uh -huh. for the average person exactly what what your plan is, mm -hmm. not what you think we should do. Because the cute thing about this is that a lot of people who have been voting on the Democratic side have been saying this to them. For so it's time. cool, we're there, we match. Tell me how you're gonna fix it because we're already there and you're in the space to actually make these things happen. We've yeah. already agreed on this. There are some details so, in other areas, but in the, like she doesn't say, I'm going to sponsor a constitutional amendment that will ban money in politics. Like there's nothing that, I don't know how she's actually gonna do it. She says she's interested in it. So without a solution being put on paper, I have to look at your past, which look, maybe Nancy Pelosi's only as bad as a lot of other politicians right. in this area, but that's pretty bad when it comes to money and politics. I mean, it is still big. It's not as bad on the Democratic side as it's on the Republican side, but it's really bad on both sides. Um, now, on other areas, she does have some more details. That's true. So, um, and this gets into a little bit of the lobbyist stuff, but she says we will expand conflict of interest laws, ban members of Congress from serving on for-profit boards, revamp the oversight authority of the Office of Government Ethics. Good, that's that's big on a lot of people's lists. Um, and prohibit public servants from receiving bonus payments from their former employers to enter government. So a little bit of that revolving door stuff. Mm -hmm. That is good, and certainly politicians you know, giving industry what they want, knowing that they will one day go to serve those industries as lobbyists. That is big, I don't think that that's the lion's share. I think that the direct contributions while they're in office is a far bigger problem. And I don't see anything there that would actually deal with that. I, and here's the thing, Ditto. 
It's not like Nancy Pelosi in the short term is gonna be able to snap her fingers and there goes money in politics. But what she could say is, I am going to put pressure on the entire Democratic caucus to ban, to not accept corporate PAC money. We're not gonna accept money from fossil fuels. We're not gonna accept money from the pharmaceutical industries. I can't make the Republicans do this, but I will say this, as speaker, I will lead a caucus that will not accept this money. She could try to make that promise, and, and I don't see that. Exactly, and I think that's what in a lot of this, even, even when it's being explained, I think some of the explanations on what you're going to do still need to be broken down. Because oftentimes, I think voters are hearing, yes, you agree with me, you want this, but we couldn't do it because it just can't be done. There's more of this, there's this and this and this, this has to be done, so then it's not done. Mm-hmm. And so I think people need, especially in this space that we're in where younger people are necessary and they're voting and they're paying attention and they want to get it. They want to know what's going on and this mm-hmm. just, um, this is a step back for me, for yeah. me. And I feel like I'm being kind of a Debbie Downer. That's okay. Yeah, is that okay? It's, it's Monday. Part. Yeah. But there's a bit of that. <laughs> uh, okay, so a little bit more on uh, voting rights. Uh, she says we must renew the Voting Rights Act to protect every citizen's access to the ballot box and restore vital safeguard of pre-clearance requirements for areas with a history of voter suppression. Getting into the, the fact that for decades, uh, states that had a history of racial voter suppression, if they wanted to make a change, they would have to go through the Supreme Court first. Mm-hmm. That was stripped away. Since then, we've seen a drastic increase in voter suppression in exactly those states. Hopefully, we can reverse that. Uh, she says we will promote national automatic voter registration, bolster our critical election infrastructure against foreign attackers, and put an end to partisan gerrymandering once and for all by establishing federal guidelines to outlaw the practice. So, look, those are some specific things. Some of them I'm not entirely sure how much Congress can actually do in terms of the, the oversight of federal, um, you know, the, over the, the voting systems, because right now that is a state thing. Um, I, I guess a necessary follow question would be things like national automatic voter registration and things in that area. I mean, why didn't we do that the last time that you were the Speaker of the House and we had a Democratic <laughs> Senate and a Democratic President? Those seem like the sorts of things we could have done. Am I am I being a Debbie Downer? Am I being too picky? No, I'm. I've Those just, are wildly popular things that weren't acted on when we had the authority to do it. Right. So maybe we'll do it now. There but the too. Situa- what, what's right, that? The problems existed then too. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You know, we hadn't. You know, they hadn't gotten rid of the Voting Rights Act at that point, but we still had really low voter participation. We had even more restrictive um, of registration deadlines and things like that. We had less vote by mail, but now we have a rise of voter ID and things like that. It seems overdue mm-hmm. to do something in this area. And by the way, she does have sort of a grab bag of different other priorities. Lower health care costs, rebuild US infrastructure, raise the minimum wage, bipartisan solutions to prevent gun violence. That'll, that'll get your pulse pumping. Um, confront discrimination with the Equality Act, pass the DREAM Act. So some of these are specific, some of them are not so much. Rebuild the US infrastructure is a pretty broad thing. But things like raise the minimum wage is very specific. And what makes me glad about this is not that her putting on a paper means that she's necessarily gonna do it. And she's not gonna do it just because we tell her to. Right. But there are now an increasing number of people in her caucus that have shown, even before they have the majority, that they're willing to hold her accountable. And, so and just even, even the list says you know, to voters, you know, hey, I'm, I'm listening, I hear you. Mm-hmm. We'll see. That's good. But that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And the thing is, like, I I would assume that Nancy Pelosi, having been the speaker and lost losing control of the House, now finally getting it back after eight years out in the wilderness, would know that if you write an op-ed like this, and then two years go by and you don't even try to make progress on these, a House majority that's given to you can be taken away. That that's the way our elections have gone. They tend to be very national. Uh, People vote on very partisan ways. Um, Now, she will not be able to pass the vast majority of this because the Republicans won't work with her and Donald Trump wouldn't sign it anyway. But she does need to show a willingness to actually try, pass it in the House, maybe it dies overall. But it puts pressure on the Republicans, it puts them on the record on many of these. Some of these are the most important issues for a lot of voters. So I would like to see action to the extent that she can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's just talk very briefly about this. I wish that we had more time, but uh, the intercept did a great job in gaining access to some leaked internal documents from the healthcare industry of how they're going to try to fight back against a push for Medicare for all. This is coming from over the summer, there was the Partnership for America's Healthcare Future was founded by lobbyists and other people in that industry. Their job is going forward to stop you from wanting Medicare for all. So we have some idea of how they're gonna do it. If you bring up this first page from their leaked documents, 
They say they want to change the national conversation and minimize the potential for this option in healthcare from becoming part of a national political party's platform in 2020. That has very sterile, vague language, but what that means is make sure that the Democratic nominee for the presidency does not run on Medicare for all. So they're talking vaguely and generally, they mean a specific thing. Do not allow a Democratic candidate who's going to run from on Medicare for all to become the presidential nominee. So going forward, as people start to announce and we start to have debates and their social media campaigns, remember in the background, there is a very powerful and well-funded lobbying group that is gonna be doing everything they can to torpedo anyone who's running on this or similar issues. And just the, just the two hands of this, one side, everyone gets health care. Mm -hmm. One side, the insurance company, <laughs> the, insur the big insurance business, Goes down. Mm -hmm. I just, I, we are, there are so many bad people in this country, okay? Mm -hmm. So many bad people because yeah. this is not, I mean, it's simple. It, seem, it seems like it would be. And I know, look, a lot of people ran on Medicare for All, did quite well in this last election. Um, but I've been saying from the very beginning that simply running on it, like a lot of people believe that if you check a couple of boxes, then you're good. Because it's popular, if we mm. jump ahead, 70% of Americans support Medicare for all right now. That's 85% of Democrats, 52%, in fact, a majority of Republicans. But the thing is, they're going to be fighting back against it. They're gonna be trying to, to show that it's extreme or too expensive or wasteful or destroys the current <laughs> system, which sort of so goes bad. without saying. Um, so just bear in mind that we are going to have to have that debate. We haven't already won just because we support a policy that is superior in virtually every way. Yeah. Even though that seems counterfactual. It just, yeah. Yes. Okay, we are gonna take a short break. When we come back, uh, JC Reese is gonna be joining us, author of uh, The End of Animal Farming, to talk about industrialized agriculture and what we can possibly do to have less of a negative impact on our health and on the climate after this. Lurking in the background of our talks nationally about uh, the current state of our health, the American diet, and also increasing climate change around the world is the specter of animal agriculture. Rarely talked about, but it has a big effect. And uh, joining us now on the show to talk about that and other issues around this, JC Reese, author of The End of Animal Farming. JC, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, great to have you here. So I'm very excited to talk to you about your book, uh, also your TEDx talk uh, that, I, uh, that I watched. And uh, so you talk about Sort of the distinction between individual potential changes to diet and what effect they can have individually and nationally, and then also large scale problems. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Why do you think we need to reframe the way we talk about uh, what we eat in terms of animals? Yeah, exactly. So as you mentioned, with all the fossil fuel and other issues that are more apparent in climate conversations, usually animal agriculture is just discussed as a personal diet or lifestyle or choice in some way. You know, words like vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian, pescatarian. And historically, I mean, for, for decades and even centuries, you know, back when Pythagoras, you know, had the first vegetarian diet in Western culture, or when people were doing it for religious and, and purity and aesthetic reasons, everyone saw it as an individual choice. And I think that's limited its role in our national discourse on food issues, especially climate issues, but also animal welfare, human health, all of these things. And if we want to progress, if we want to see this the way we see other important climate and, and health and food issues, then we need to think about institutional solutions. So how can we as a society, as America, transition away from animal farming? Can we use technology? Can we use government policy? Can we use things like, let's say, meat taxes, for example? Or can we use business approaches like meatless Mondays in college mm -hmm. cafeterias? And all of this, I think, you know, based on the evidence from historical social change, will be a lot more successful. So I want to talk to you about the, the stakes in a couple of different areas. So um, people in America are very worried about their diets. You hear a lot of talk about sugar and about carbs. And uh, to the extent that people are worried about climate change, you hear a lot about electricity generation and uh, automobiles and things like that. Um, how big are the stakes in these different areas when it comes specifically to the way we produce and consume our food in terms of animals? 
Yeah, the stakes, uh, no pun intended, are huge, uh, very important. <laughs> it's kind of seen as the the uh, elephant in the room of, of climate. I make that joke, joke a lot. <laughs> uh, the elephant in the room. So you have, you know, more greenhouse gas emissions coming from animal agriculture than the entire transportation sector. Um, so transport is at something like 13.5%. The lowest estimate for animal agriculture is usually around 14%, goes up to 18%, and might even be well over 20%. Um, when it comes to human health, it's seen as a huge contributor to heart disease, to diabetes, to, to many chronic illnesses. You know, doctors are increasingly seeing those as, as lifestyle diseases rather than purely as, you know, medical and pharmaceutical issues. Uh, there are, in total, over 100 billion animals in the food system. Anytime you're using, you know, that sort of scale, when you're feeding the entire population, you're going to get huge climate and health issues and, and all of these things. I mean, a lot of people notice first the cruelty. You know, they see undercover investigations where, you know, egg laying hens, for example, are, are kept on a uh, kept in a cage so small that they can't even spread their wings or or move around. They certainly can't dust bathe or exhibit other natural behaviors. Um, but then, you know, with Cowspiracy, you know, this big documentary that hit Netflix or its more recent uh, version, What the Health, uh, addressing the health issues of animal agriculture, people are seeing these these really large uh, stakes involved with with animal agriculture. So uh, let's talk about. Um in terms of some of the industries that are attempting to, I guess, make animals obsolete in terms of the food. You have these alternatives that, that you've sketched out um, in terms of like fake meats, but also lab grown meat. Uh, what, what are the range of options that are available right now and in the near future? Like how much do you think they're doing to fill the gap in your mind? Yeah, I've got another pun for you. Uh, one of the book titles, potential book titles was Obso Meat. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's not a very funny one. Um, so, so right now we have uh, veggie burgers. You know, historically we've had things that were made from beans and legumes and vegetables. You can even sometimes see the little bits of vegetable in them. Uh, that was appealing to a very specific consumer, the sort of consumer who wanted local, organic kind of garden food. Uh, but now you're seeing veggie burgers that bleed, uh, that that cook, you know, that brown like animal-based beef. Uh, there have been so many advances in food science, and we see this with all sorts of processed food and and things that we now might not want as much, but is, is designed to appeal to our taste. And now that same food science, that understanding of, you know, what are the proteins, what are the fats, what are the specific compounds that give, you know, red meat or, or other animal products their distinguishing flavor? How can we find those in the plant kingdom and, and build them, assemble them into the architecture of meat? Um, companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and some lesser known ones like Hungry Planet are starting to do this by, you know, creating first the veggie burger, uh, so a burger that to many people is indistinguishable, in fact, from animal-based beef. Uh, Beyond Meat is now doing it with sausage. Uh, they might even have a breakfast sausage coming out soon. Uh, a lot of these, you know, uh, ground beef products or like a chicken nugget or a chicken tender are the easiest. You know, they're not as complicated as a steak, so it's easier to mimic uh, what people want from the animal products. Uh, but then we're also seeing, you know, building actual animal flesh from the ground up using animal cells. So this is sometimes referred to as lab grown meat uh, because it's the science, the research is being done right now in, in food labs. Um, it is taking a small sample of cells from a living animal. You can take a needle biopsy like what you get at the doctor's office, or you could take a Q-tip of saliva or uh, even a chicken's feather to get a small, any small amount of cells. And then you just grow those cells. You put them in the same environment that you want. Uh, that is, you know, what produces meat inside the animal's body. So you have sugar, you know, some sort of energy. You have the nutrients, the building blocks for those cells. You have growth factors, you know, that can tell the cells when to grow and how to grow the same way molecular signals do in an animal's body. And now we have a lot of prototypes of these products. So they're, they're still quite expensive. Really, the uh, entire research challenge here is scale, you know, taking this technology that's primarily used in the biomedical industry and applying it to the, again, those huge stakes in the food system. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of different options, uh, some available now, but some coming uh, in the near future. Um, I want to talk to you about one other thing, though. Uh, so when we talk about you know how many people are going to be supportive of these sorts of things, we, we know that vegetarians and vegans make up still a, a relatively small percentage of the population. But when it comes to the large scale changes that you're talking about, like there's uh, the, the question of banning slaughterhouses or switching to cage free eggs or lab grown meat, things like that. How supportive is the American public? 
Yeah, so it's really weird from the perspective of, you know, I went vegan when I started this research, but I talked to a lot of people who have been vegan for for decades, and they, you know, think, okay, we have to convert people to at least vegetarianism to get them on board with something like banning slaughterhouses or to get them on board with what I refer to as institutional change. Uh, But in fact, you see much larger support. So with Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, for example, the consumers of those products are, are mostly not vegetarians and vegans. They're consumers who are aware of factory farming. They know it's a problem, they know it's bad for their health, and they want to make changes, but they haven't found the moral impetus to do it uh, by switching to those cardboard you know, veggie burgers or to fruits and vegetables. Um, but they are starting to do it because they have these sophisticated plant-based products available, and I think they'll start to do it with, with cell-cultured meat. Um, in fact, somewhere over you know, 70%, sometimes over 80%, of the consumers of each of these new plant-based products are omnivores. And, mm. and when you ask people, you know, would they support these new products? Would they eat them? Uh, would they support a policy change like banning slaughterhouses? You see really large percentages of the population. You know, the, the end goal to many people is, is a complete ban on slaughterhouses. And you might think, okay, a few most vegans are willing to do that. Not all vegans want to impose their diet on the population. And then maybe a few other people, but, but certainly not more than 10% of the population want something so drastic. Uh, but when we did a survey at the think tank I worked for last year of U.S. adults, in fact, 47% supported a ban on all wow. slaughterhouses. Wow, that's amazing. Certainly higher than I would have expected. Mm-hmm. Well, JC Reese, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, very interesting stuff uh, detailed in your book, uh, The End of Animal Farming. We really appreciate it. Thanks for tackling this issue. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take uh, one more break. Um, Brooke, thank you so much for joining us. Always good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Always um, good maybe, to be here. Maybe at some point in the near future, we can do sort of a comparison taste test of some of the <laughs> options that are available right now. I'm down. I know of a few that are already awesome, actually. Okay. So maybe we can talk a little bit about those in the near future. Uh, we're gonna take one more break. On the other side, more on climate change. A recently released government report making clear how big the stakes are after this. Welcome back everyone, very little time, super important topic to get to though. What does our government actually think about climate change? Well, if you focus at the doofus on the top, you might think uh, tweets like brutal and extended cold blasts could shatter all records, whatever happened to global warming? That's Donald Trump and it makes you think that we are led by literally the stupid people, stupidest people in our country and we will do nothing to confront climate change. Um, I can't say that we will do much, but thankfully there are more responsible people than Donald Trump uh, functioning in government. And so uh, over the Thanksgiving break, a report came out that makes clear how horrible climate change is actually going to end up being for the United States. This is the fourth national climate assessment. Uh, it's required by Congress, we've had four it turns out. And uh, this is the second of two volumes that came out. The first was back in November of 2017, which concluded that there is quote, no convincing alternative explanation for the climate change other than human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases. Now understand, this report is put together by literally over a thousand people, including hundreds of scientists, about half of are in government, half outside of it. They all, unlike Donald Trump, have actually studied this material, so they know what they're talking about. So we're done with whether we're responsible for this. The climate is changing, that's a fact, we caused it, that's a fact. Now we're gonna have to see what we're going to do about it if we wanna avoid the sorts of consequences detailed in the report. And I wanna read some of those for you because we all know like the oceans are gonna rise, it's gonna get hot. But it's gonna affect so many different areas that even people who focus a lot on this topic don't necessarily know about. So first of all, the cost of climate change could reach hundreds of billions of dollars every single year. The Southeast alone will probably lose over a half a billion labor hours by 2100 due to extreme heat. So every time you hear a boneheaded politician say that we can't do anything about climate change because it would hurt the economy too much, understand that doing nothing is going to devastate our economy. So that is a that is a stupid talking point that we need to move past as a country and as a civilization. Um, moving on, in parts of the Midwest, farms will be able to produce less than 75% of the corn they produce today. And the southern part of the region could lose more than 25% of its soybean yield to give you, to give you an idea of the effect it's going to have on our ability to produce food. Now you might think, hey, 75%, that's still most. Okay, our population is still rapidly rising. And by 2100, we're gonna need far more food, not 25% less than we're currently producing. And sure, we're talking a lot about corn. Did you know that basically in America, we only eat corn and soybeans? That's really significant actually, but moving on. 
Uh, really important for the California context right now, wildfire seasons already longer and more destructive than before could burn up to six times more forest annu area annually by 25, uh, 20, 2050, I should say, in parts of the US. Burned areas in southwestern California could double by 2050. We are already being devastated and you can expect that it will get worse. Uh, in terms of the effect on human lives, the Midwest alone, which is predicted to have the largest increase in extreme temperature, could see an additional 2,000 premature deaths every year by 2090. So again, life and death situation, thousands of lives on the line just from extreme heat, let alone extreme weather events and things like that. Uh, we can expect more blackouts and power failures. A potential loss in some sectors could reach hundreds of billions of dollars every year by the end of the century, just in terms of energy production. And get ready for, obviously, more hot days. The number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit will multiply. Chicago could start to resemble Phoenix or Las Vegas with up to two months a year of 100 degree plus days. Absolutely devastating. This is just the bare minimum. Take a look at the report. They pushed it out on Black Friday so that you wouldn't see it. Hopefully, people will still pay attention. Uh, that said, thank you for joining us on the Damage Report. We will see you tomorrow morning with much more for you. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.